Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Bible Study Live at 7.05. Again, I have with me Rowdy Schmidt and Steve Groft. And we'll welcome you all back to our study tonight. The subject matter is the battle between good and evil. That's what our discussion will be about tonight. But before we start, um, just want to uh, remind everyone that our Bible or our Facebook Live Bible study tonight will once again be uh, uploaded to YouTube and archived there on my page, Danny Henson Jr. So if you go to YouTube and type in Danny Henson Jr., you'll be able to pull up my, my YouTube page. And all of our Friday night studies, um, at least those for the past few weeks, will be archived from now on on, uh, on Very YouTube. Very good. So, before we begin our study tonight, could I enlist the help of one of the two of you to, to say a word, a word of prayer? Thank you. Let us pray. <clears throat> Dear God in heaven, our subject is a vital one tonight. Where, where did the trouble, and there's so much trouble, Lord, on our earth, where did it come from in a perfect God, in a perfect heaven? Where did this trouble come from? We need to understand this subject to be protected from the evil that's around us. There is a pathway of safety and blessing, and we want to find it. Dear Lord, as we study tonight, we ask your Holy Spirit blessing upon your word and the minds of our hearers and on us three also. Lord, give us your Holy Spirit, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So last week, for those of you who maybe are tuning in for the first time or first time in a few weeks or whatever the case might be, last week we were dealing with, well, not just last week, I last guess. Last three weeks. Last three weeks. Um, we were dealing with this unknown God, or in other words, um, the fact that there is a difference between knowing about God and actually knowing God. Um, we compared and contrasted the traditions and cultures of modern society as they pertain to Christianity and some other religious groups and how it's our contention that there are some, some what would you say, some mischaracterizations Absolutely. Uh, about God that are being taught and being perpetrated on humanity. So, the Bible suggests that knowing God is of utmost importance um, to know Him correctly as He's revealed Himself to us. Mm -hmm. And we kind of went on a lengthy three-week discussion about the importance of knowing God and, on the other side of that coin, the dangers of not knowing Him. That's right. The deceptions that lay in wait. And that brought us to the discussion that we're going to begin tonight, the battle between good and evil. So we know that God intended for us to know him, that he wanted, desired mm -hmm. to reveal himself to us. Um, but there's a problem that has stood in the way uh, of men for generations now mm -hmm. um, when it comes to knowing God. So we have to start back in the beginning of this great controversy between good and evil and, uh, and begin to examine what's happened, um, what's blocking humanity from, from coming to know the knowledge of God um, and coming into relationship with Him. So, Rowdy has once again prepared a study for us to examine tonight, and I'm excited to do so. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, we'll just start in the book of Revelation. We, we've spent a lot of time on Bible prophecy. In this in this group both the one as it exists today and you know as it um, started over a year ago uh, we've spent a lot of time dealing with Bible prophecy and we'll continue to look at Bible prophecy in the future but the book of Revelation is in large part a book of prophecy it's a book that foretells what will shortly happen what will shortly come to pass and we're going to turn there initially uh, just to begin our study tonight and we're looking at Revelation chapter 12. Uh, could one of you guys read 
the passage that is now on the screen. I'll read and I'm sure Rowdy has some comments here. This is Revelation 12, verse 7. A very mysterious scripture when you think of heaven. It says, And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels. Rowdy? It's unbelievable if you think about it, that of all places, of all places, is nothing sacred, we say in our culture. And here is war in heaven. You think that before our creation, before sin entered our world, there was a point at which sin didn't exist. That's right. That's right. And the, the beautiful picture that we get from Scripture is we, we think of words like bliss and we think of, of, of heavenly, we, we think of wonder, we think Peace. of so many words. Perfection. That's right, that would describe an environment without sin. Un, unspeakable beauty and magnificence. That's what... Harmony. Selfless love. Yeah. Selfless love. And so, mm. at some point in the eternal past, and we don't know how far beyond our creation this actually started, it's not really revealed in Scripture. All we know is that at some point in the, in the ceaseless ages of the past, a point in time came where a created being... He's referred to as many names. We, we call him the dragon. We call him Lucifer. We call Lucifer. him Satan. Satan. We, we call him so many different names. The destroyer. Accuser of the brethren. But at some point, this, this individual, this created being, had a change of mind, a change of heart, a, a, a change in perspective. Mm -hmm that the Bible here in Revelation 12, 7 reveals as, as a war. That's right. Um, I, I guess we can save Michael for another night. A lot of, a lot of people like to, like to discuss the Michael character and who he might be. That's right. Um, we could look at, at that topic at a, at a later date. Sure. But Michael and the dragon uh, had a war with each, with each other and and, and we'll see how this develops. But what's interesting to me is the environment in which this, um, this conflict begins. Because uh, as we read in the book of Psalms, the, the scriptures on the screen behind me, it's describing being in the presence of God. So um, this is where this controversy began. And it says, Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Can you imagine uh, living in an environment and having a day-by-day, moment-by-moment experience that is ceaseless? And the, the, the only way you could describe that ceaseless experience is one of fullness of joy, of joy. and perfect and complete pleasure. I've, I've experienced some joy, but I, I don't know it's ever been full? that it's ever been a fullness right. of joy. Mm -hmm. that's, that's an incredible thought, just trying to uh, allow your mind to explore the possibility of what fullness might, might comprehend in we, this passage. You know, Danny, we do have joy on this earth. We have joy in our family. We have joy in the work of our hands. Mm -hmm. We have joy... In nature, we have joy in just knowing God. Mm -hmm. That dimension can be yours if you study the Bible. Mm -hmm. But you know, uh, we have an enemy here right. who is waiting on in every dark corner to stick his leg out and trip us and bring us down from this joy. That's right. And so I'm sure that that's been your experience. Mm -hmm. Uh, sort of sp spasmodic in this world. It's very sad. You get frustrated. That's mm -hmm. right. You, you really get frustrated that you can't have a, a stretched out season where you can enjoy. Always something comes from the corner mm -hmm. to trip you up. Wow. That's right. 
sad. But we're going to study that tonight. Yeah, we are. You know, there's another scripture that uh, we didn't get a chance to really include, but it's Psalms 145, verse 16, mm -hmm. for those of you that might want to take a note. Listen to this. It goes, it goes hand in hand really well with the previous verse here. It, it says of him, our creator, our maker, that he opens his hand and he satisfies the desire of every living thing. It's beautiful. Now, here in this earth, because of the nature of what sin is, we experience needs and desires. Mm -hmm. It's a constant uh, tug of war every day where we're needing something and desiring something. And quite often, the things that we're desiring are the things we need. Mm -hmm. I need, I desire more money. I desire more time with my family. I desire better health. Wonderful. But in heaven, as I was thinking about this, I can't imagine that you ever really feel a desire because he is continually, constantly supplying everything that you could ever want before you even could realize that you need it or want it. Right. So need and desire, I don't think, is, is a concept that existed before sin. Right. Huh. It, it is an interesting thought. I, mm -hmm. To be in his presence and to have all of these things supplied, to experience a fullness of joy. In all their fullness. Um, unfortunately, it's beyond my comprehension. Far beyond mine. But I have... Uh, a, a, a very strong desire to find out what it's talking about. Me too. Um, it's incredibly encouraging. That, that <clears throat> what's the New Testament say that that um, that we see through a glass dimly? Dimly. So you desire to understand the glories of heaven, the glories of God, the glories of Christ, and the experience of being in their presence. There's that that beautiful song. Um, that that contemporary artist sang that said, "I could only imagine." I can only imagine. Mercy me. Uh, mercy me. That's right. It's a it's a beautiful song, but when you sit and try to contemplate what has been prepared for us, the the only thing you could say is, "I guess I could only see through this glass dimly." That's right. Well, and, and there's that verse that I have not seen and ear has not heard, and neither has entered into the heart and mind of man, the things that God has prepared for them that love him. So, so think about that. We're encouraged to use our wildest imagination right. and even stretching our imagination. The reality still never enters as a thought into our heart and mind. It is so far beyond in, in a glorious manner what we can even anticipate and imagine. I'm looking forward to to, to experience well, I am too, brother. Praise the Lord. Um, you know, what's distressing about this contemplation is that in this environment that we're described, that's being described, that we're discussing, mm. Lucifer was born. So in, in this state of perpetual joy, Joy and pleasure, and pleasure and substance, um, satisfaction is a good word. Yeah. Satisfaction. That's right. In this state of satisfaction, this thing began that the Bible describes as the mystery of iniquity, mm. Mm. and uh, it baffles me. Um, but in this environment. Lucifer, and, and maybe you could talk a little bit about the meaning of that, that name. Sure. This person, Lucifer, started to have a different experience. May, may I uh, bring a, say, I would say the other side of the coin. You have a verse on here, Danny, that without faith, and there's a lot of people who are languishing in our world right now, and they're suffering. They, they can't even imagine what this even means. Mm. This is so remote from their experience that they probably think we're in some kind of a bubble right now. We're taking joy at a scripture that they can't even relate to. So looking at the other side of the coin, there was a king in this Bible who was the richest man who ever lived. 
the blessing of God that we are seeing in this scripture was upon him in a marvelous, mag magnanimous way. But I would like to read the words that this man wrote in this Bible. Because I think the people of this world are trying... We have faith, brother. I'm, I, I'm not bragging. We have a gift of faith that lets us open our eyes and see that this is a reality. This pleasures forevermore. Mm -hmm. And we want that our listeners can bridge over from this world that we live in, this darkened world, where we have an enemy who's trying to hurt us at every turn, mm -hmm. that by faith we can bridge over from this darkened world. That's right. But maybe this is, this is closer to your experience. The richest king that ever lived on the face of this earth. He said in Ecclesiastes, Chapter 2 and verse 4. I made me great works. I builded me houses. I planted me vineyards. I made me gardens and arches. And I planted trees in them of all kinds of fruit. I made me pools of water. To water therewith the wood and bring forth trees. I got me servants and maidens. And had servants born in my house. Also I had great possessions of great and small cattle above all that were in Jerusalem before me. I gathered me also silver and gold and the peculiar treasure of kings and of the provinces. I got me men singers, women singers, and the delights of the son of men, and musical instruments, and that of all sorts. So I was great and increased more than all that were before me in Jerusalem. Also, my wisdom remained with me. And whatsoever mine eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I, I for my heart rejoiced in all my labor, and this was my portion of all my labor. Then I looked on the works that my hands had wrought, and on the labor that I had labored to do. And behold, all was vanity. It was empty and vexation of spirit, frustration and dissatisfaction. And there was no profit under the sun. What is wrong with our world that this kind of words could be written in this Bible? You know, there's a New Testament parallel that sums it up nicely. Lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Yes. Something was missing. Brother. The very pleasure that we were created for, His presence, the fullness of joy and, and, and pleasure, somehow we get sidetracked and distracted and caught up with the earthly pleasures and we become lovers of those pleasures more than lovers of the pleasure of His presence. Yeah. Yes. Yes, that's good. And I think as you read that, that laid it out for all of us. I think we all come to moments where we we finally have a moment of clarity mm -hmm. and it's deep regret. Yeah. You know, it's interesting in, in the past couple of years um, some pretty big name people um, Anthony Bourdain um, Robin Williams mm -hmm. People that have been celebrated yeah. internationally. Yes, admired um, and loved and exalted. Yes, in, 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 every, in every facet of their chosen profession. Um, wealth, um, relationships with the most beautiful of people. Um, yet, for some reason, if you believe, in fact, that they were... They, that, that they were um, killed by suicide um, chose to, to depart this life um, even though they had more than most of us could ever dream yeah. fame and fortune popularity, yeah. admiration yeah. that speaks so strongly to us if we'll just listen He's, he wants us to know that there's nothing in this life that's going to satisfy you. 
You can have everything that this world has to offer and you are not going to find satisfaction in it. You're not going to find eternal satisfaction. It's going to feel good to the flesh while you're doing it. Mm -hmm. And, and we've all been young and we've all done stuff that felt really, really good. Temporarily. Yeah. Temporarily. Now, Roddy, I want to say something because we're, we're hatching a mighty dark egg right here. And we want to bring hope into this situation. Now, we know that we, we had a long study there the last few weeks about not recognizing who God really is. That's right. And I'm going to add to that. Getting our priorities deranged. Mm -hmm. And you suggested that for King Solomon here. Mm -hmm. He took his eyes off God and the things of this world became empty because he had they some of those above God there. And this is the problem. I, I don't want to go over this lightly, brothers. Right. And I think you're absolutely right. I think I see where you're going. This is exactly what one Lucifer did. And yes. it's exactly what we all do. The way we find ourselves estranged from him and his plan for us, which is far better than anything else we'll ever pursue on our own. The way we find ourselves separated from him is we take our eyes off and we lose perspective. Yes, we do. And somewhere in Lucifer's mind, a change took yes, place. It did. Yes, it did. Not only did he lose sight of his maker, somewhere he had to have lost sight of the type of person he really was. Mm -hmm. And I think that is exactly the principle that we find in Scripture. You touched on it uh, uh, a week or two ago, you, you used an analogy about light shining in darkness. Mm -hmm. And somewhere in, in Lucifer's mind, a darkness took place. A, he, lost, he lost the light of the knowledge of the character of God. And as darkness settled on him, selfishness begins to take place. Self-seeking begins to take place. And we'll learn as we study this out that that's exactly what has happened here on earth. That same darkness that settled down on his mind and then on the minds of billions of yes. angels. Yes. That darkness about the incorrect ideas about our maker mm -hmm. is a darkness. That's the way scripture defines it. Mm -hmm. and, and so it comes to us through, through the fall from, from the Garden of Eden all the way down through oh, human yeah. history. And you... Uh, that's what kind of inspired this, this idea for this study, is that, in a nutshell, is the great controversy. It is this war. Mm -hmm. The war is over the truth about the character of God. That's right. Let, let, can I read a scripture that, uh, you know, you, you said something that's imperceptible, almost, that a change took place in Lucifer. But as we listen to other people, and listen to ourselves, we can read the inner workings of our mind and heart. And I'd like to read a scripture that uh, is the footprints of this imperceptible change that came to Lucifer. Sure. This is found in Isaiah chapter 14. And if I get ahead of the study, we'll just read it again when you... You're, you're, you're about to, but let me fast forward to it. Okay, very good. We'll come back to, to the to other one here. And, and, and although this is, this is some strange information, I think that, that the true imperceptible change in Lucifer, who, who got a new name, Satan, who was Lucifer, then Satan, we'll, we'll kind of explain that in a minute. Let's listen to this little speech here. Uh, Isaiah chapter 14, verse 13. This is Lucifer talking. This is a look into the mind. You know, <clears throat> before he rose to power in Germany, Hitler was in jail for a while. And while in jail, he wrote a book. He wrote a book about his plan. It's called, I'm going to try to say it, Mein Kampf. Yes, that's right. And in that book, he graphically portrayed what his plan was. Mm -hmm. And I guess if people would have paid attention, they, you know, they didn't take him serious at the beginning. But here we're going to get a look into the mind of Lucifer. It says here, God said, 
For thou hast said in thine heart, pull back the curtain now, we're going to look into the heart of Satan. Here's his first little speech. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I, notice, I, where is his focus? I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. Very ambitious. Very self-focused. Instead of God-focused, brothers and sisters, King Solomon, because he was self-focused, and that's all we have in this world if we don't know God. We, we love self. We placate self. We feed self. We worship self. And it is our biggest enemy. Shall I continue? Absolutely. Verse 14. I, once again, let's count them. I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I will be like the Most High. Mm. Instead of focusing on God. So let's, let's just get it out here plain at the beginning of our study. Then we'll go back. If God is out of focus in our life, we just studied for three weeks, getting the true God clearly in focus in our mind without all the slander and all the misrepresentation and all the false information about God, but get a clear picture of who God is, the rest of our life falls into order. That's right. That's right. Here is Satan, Lucifer, who became Satan. And I will say, since we were going to talk about that name, Lucifer is a is a Latin word. It, it's two words put together. Lucif, Luce, L-U-C, which means light. We talked a lot about light. And what does the second part mean? He was to bear, this is a, he was to carry the light. He stood next to the throne of God. He would receive the light from God and he was to carry it to all of the universe. Lucifer, he was the light bearer. And he became Satan, the deceiver. Because in his embarrassment and in his guilt and in his rebellion, he began to, to deceive the minds of the angels in heaven. This is where the war is coming into play. That's right. and, and God had to handle this very delicately. We're going to get to that. This, this is a major part of the story. God had to delicately handle this monster that was growing right beside him becoming self-focused and if you didn't if you can't see the self-focus in this what i just read count the eyes in this passage of scripture that's right well that's that's the interesting thing about this story satan begins to to go through a change and and we'll pick it up the same story being told in in old testament scripture and i think yeah we'll start in in Ezekiel chapter 28, Sorality, if you want to kind of lead us through Ezekiel 28, starting in verse 11, sure. um, we'll look at, at how this began to unfold. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus says the Lord God, You seal up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You've been in Eden, the garden of God, and every precious stone was your covering. The sardis, topaz, the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, and the emerald, and the carbuncle, and the gold. And the workmanship of thy tabrets and thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that you were created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covers, and I have set thee so. You've been upon the holy mountain of God. You've walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. You were perfect in your ways from the day that you were created until iniquity was found in you. By the multitude of your merchandise you filled... They have filled the midst of thee with violence, and you have sinned. Therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty, and you have corrupted your wisdom 
by reason of your brightness. Uh, there's a an interesting thing that happens at the end of this uh, at the end of this description in Ezekiel 28 where we see what motivated the change in, yes. in Lucifer. Yes. Uh, it says, Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Mm -hmm. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom. Mm -hmm. So you, you spent all this time talking about, in, in the last two or three weeks, talking about knowing God um, and the necessity to know him. Yet Lucifer, this angel that was beautiful, um, spectacular, um, all these precious things were used as coverings for him. Um, he was given, you know, uh, some type of a, a great blessing in musical Music, ability. Musical ability. Um, he was, according to verse 16, the covering cherub. Mm -hmm. Now, when I think of covering chair, my mind goes immediately to the Ark of the Covenant. Mm -hmm. And, and those, those pictures and representations we've seen in movies like Raiders of the Lost Ark with the... Uh, with, uh, um, oh, yes. What's his name? Henry. Uh, oh, my God. Harrison Ford. Harrison, Harrison Ford, Ford, thank you. Um, you think of this box that contained the Ten Commandments that had these two golden angels over the top of it, whose wings met in the center. They were covering cherubs. They covered the mercy seat mm -hmm. of the Ark of the Covenant, which was where God's presence was to be found in the sanctuary. So this earthly representation that Moses had constructed, which was a type... To represent things that existed in heaven. That actually exist in heaven. Uh, that he was shown, apparently, right. that Moses was was shown mm -hmm. on, on Mount Sinai. So, Lucifer was a covering cherub. Mm -hmm. yes. He was in the very presence of God. Um, we talked about being in the presence of God and the fullness of joy and the pleasures forevermore yes. and, <laughs> and, and the substance and the blessing and the satisfactory that comes from this. And this is precisely where Lucifer spent his time. That's right. From this, the day he was created. This was his yeah. job. He, he was yeah. there for Highly this purpose. Highly exalted. Yes. Highly. And it's because of this, because of this exalt, exalted position, because of his beauty, um, his heart became lifted up. And what's interesting about this verse in verse 17 of chapter 28, it says that his wisdom was corrupt. That's right. His thinking. His yes. thinking was distorted. Yes. He was no longer able, apparently, to reason correctly. To reason properly, right? Yes. And That's I right. think about some of the behavior that I participated in yes. when I was younger. Yes. Oftentimes, I was worked into a fr uh, 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 a a fury or whipped into a lustful. Uh, mindset or an intoxicated um, mindset mm -hmm. and was no longer capable mm -hmm. of making righteous decisions. Right. Incapable. My, my decisions became completely self-centered mm -hmm. and as Brother Groft read before as he moved through Isaiah um, which we'll go back to here. Isaiah 14. It, it basically ended in him engaging in warfare with his own creator, the one that had blessed him with all these tremendous things. But he, he became envious of something that he didn't have. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wow. May, may I add something to that, brother? Sure. Um, I'd like to tell our audience... Uh, just something they might have to accept by faith. But as Danny described, we've all been through that experience. And there may be somebody who's experiencing bad thinking tonight. And I would tell them, 
to the degree that they are away from God, to the degree that there is a distance between them and the rightful place of God in their life, that is a degree of their insanity. Now, I'm not trying to be funny, and I'm not trying to insult, but our minds do not work. We make all kinds of wrong decisions That's right. and impulsive, unthought through decisions. Uh, what do they call it in the store when they got all that stuff right by the cash? Impulsive decisions without thinking. Yes. But I'd like to read a scripture that contrasts this. Listen to this. Second Timothy chapter one and verse seven. Second Timothy one verse seven says, Now this is a return. We can return. Danny, you can return to proper balanced thinking. Mm -hmm. And it says here, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, mm -hmm. but of power. God has given us, if you go to God, He will give you the, the spirit of power mm -hmm. and love. And thirdly, a sound mind. Mm -hmm. Going back to the Word of God, letting the Word of God work its magic, if I can use that word, because it's, it's hard to understand. What does the word begins to change us? We don't even know how. Mm -hmm. But let that word do its work, and our brain will level off. Yeah. We will see things in their proper perspective right. and get your priorities straight, and we will begin begin to experience blessing in our life That's right. and have a sound mind. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah, while well, we could we could really venture off into some great areas, oh, and I wish I wish we had time, because there are some places that, well, that would be really be afraid. That would be I'll really write it down. fun to go. Um, <laughs> but getting back to to this change that took place in Lucifer, what we are going to learn when we come to the actual fall of of the human race, what happened in Lucifer. And the change that made him what he he is, that exact same dynamic is exactly how Eve fell. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're mm -hmm. going to see. Mm -hmm. There is only one way and one reason why we fall and why we one, turn to sin and remain in sin and separate it. It's, it's the exact same principle. We talked about learning what these principles are. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we're going to do that. I want to touch on it just a little bit here. Uh, I'm going to jump ahead just a, just a little bit for, the, for our audience. I want to, I want to paint a picture. We, we talk about sin we talk about it in relation to the law. Sin is transgression mm -hmm. of the law. Yes. And that's a perfectly fine definition, but it needs to be expanded upon because it's actually, in a way, it's far simpler than that, and it's far more beautiful than that if you understand the circumstances around which the law was given. Right. And you touched it on, on it last week. Um, where Moses had prayed, Father, show me, well, he prayed, show me your glory. Mm -hmm. And let me see you. I want to see you. That's right. I want to see who you are. Thank and you. and God responded, Paul. okay, right. I'm going to do that. But first, you're going to go down, you're going to get some plat tablets, and then you're going to come back up. And so God actually answered that. At the same time, he regave them the law. And you can't separate those two things. You can't separate that, that, that little extra bit of information. Show me your glory. I want to see who you are. Okay, go down, get some tablets, come back up in a couple days, have everybody gather, and then we're going to do this thing. That's the actual circumstances around which the law was given the second time. It was part of the answer that God gave to, to Moses. So, so Moses comes back up, and he's, he's hidden in the cleft of the rock, and God passes by and makes those pronouncements. I'm going to declare the name of the Lord, mm -hmm. right? That's what he said. Mm -hmm. What is his name? Well, we find in Scripture that a name always represents character. Yes. So, so 
God is directly tying his glory to his name, which is his character. And this is what he says about himself. This is who I am. I'm merciful, and I'm patient, and I'm good, and I'm loving, and I'm gentle. And I'm not going to just pass by the sins of people. I can't do that because I'm too loving to just let that go. Because I'm not going to let people be destroyed. They're going to suffer consequences because of because of sin, mm -hmm. but I'm not going to leave them there. I'm not just going to forget about Praise it. Lord, so now we have this law, and sin is the transgression of the law. But when you tie it to the history of how that law was given, what you really see is that it is the transgression of everything that is opposed to God's character. Sin is everything that is unlike Beautiful, God. Brother, That's man. exactly what it is. So unlike I want to give God. three Beautiful, verses. Brother. Romans 3.23, catch this. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Right. This is what Paul says. Paul, Paul got this idea. Paul is saying that if you're sinning, you're falling short of his glory, which is his character. Beautiful. In other words, if you're sinning, you're doing something that is completely unlike him. Praise That's God. what sin is. It's Praise everything God. that is unlike him. Well, what is God? God is love, according to 1 John 4. Unselfish, pure, That's right. holy. So when you're committing sin, and we know that the New Testament refers to the law of the Ten Commandments as the law of love, we, we find that throughout Scripture, that if I love my neighbor, I'm not going to murder, I'm not going to lie, I'm not going to steal, I'm not going to take his wife. If I love God, I'm not going to do those things that hurt him. I'm not going to take his name in vain. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to put something in his place. Because love, being what God is, is exactly what the law is. It, it in a way, defines what love yes. is because Beautiful. it defines his character Beautiful, for us. Brother. And so now we come to 1 Corinthians 13, 5. And if God is love, and this is one of those foundational scriptures. You get into 1 Corinthians 13, and just read this whole section because it, it defines what love, is. what love is. But you know what it's really defining? It's defining what God is. What God is. It's a self-revelation. This is God defining who he is. And part of it is this. I want to stay on topic here. Love doesn't seek its own. And, and, and to be very succinct, the idea is love isn't self-seeking. It's not focused on itself. It has no desire or Mercy. thought for itself. Mercy. It's not concerned about itself. Love is focused on everyone else, the benefit and the well-being and, and providing everything that everyone else needs. And what was the poison in Satan's mind? He was totally absorbed in with his self. self. And that's exactly right. And that's where we're going with this. When Lucifer fell, it was a fall away from love. It was a fall away from the glory of God. The Lord. He lost sight in his mind of what God is sight. truly like on some level and became twisted until his thoughts were holy of himself. And this is here's the sad part. Lucifer said, I'm going to be like the Most High. If you want to be like the Most High, you've got to be selflessly in love with everything other than yourself. So even in his confusion, his wisdom was so corrupted that go. he couldn't see that if I really want to be like God, I'm going to stop seeking self because God doesn't seek self. Does not. That's how his wisdom was so corrupted that he couldn't even see beautiful, that brother. one fine, small That's detail. Beautiful, brother. You know, it's interesting. A lot of people question suffering in general the suffering that has been caused as a result of this thing that happened with lucifer which spilled over into the heavenly hosts which spilled over into this planet and into our experience and 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 as a result has caused endless suffering uh, almost endless so i should say suffering in this planet and people question God's, they bring God's character mm -hmm. under examination in that if God's love and if God's so good, mm -hmm. 
why does he allow the suffering? And it's interesting in this verse that you just read, it says that he's not easily provoked. So yes. if, if you are evil, if you have taken an evil position, a selfish one, and that leads you to destroy others, this is a provocative act against God. Sure is. You're destroying something that he loves immensely. Mm -hmm. um, so much so, that in he fact, left heaven for. that he'd send his son to die for. Imagine that. Imagine Eli. Rowdy has a son named Eli. Imagine Eli sending him to be brutally murdered Mercy. for the sake of those who are your enemies. Mm -hmm. To save those who have sinned and grievously wronged you. Mercy, right. You know, that's a beautiful thought. We get confused with this idea about God loving his enemies and coming to die for his enemies. And it wasn't, it wasn't God coming to die for those whom he considered an enemy. It was coming to die for those who viewed him as the enemy. Well, well that's right. Yes. Well, let me finish this thought in regards to this not being easily provoked. Because God is not e is easily provoked, because he's slow to anger. And we're still in 1 Corinthians 13, by the way. Yes, we are. We, we are. We're, we're examining Rowdy verse 5. Scripture. We're examining verse 5. So because of this, God has to allow evil men and evil angels to reveal themselves. That's right. Yes. To behave. Sometimes he intervenes and saves life. Mm -hmm. Sometimes he stands back while life is taken. Yes. But God, to us this seems horrible. Mm -hmm. God, why would you allow this to happen? Mm -hmm. Because we see death as something very final. Where God sees it as temporary, temporary, mm -hmm. just a temporary state. When when you control life, when you can create life uh, and destroy it, when you have that that ultimate power, um, death isn't a, a tremendous hurdle for you to overcome. That's right. So God, from His perspective, doesn't see this in such a serious way that we do. Suffering, even. Um, when measured against what he has prepared for those that love him um, is cheap enough. The suffering that we have to suffer yes. on this planet will be Saul will be at some point recognized as being a cheap payment. Sure. Sure. A cheap payment to make right. for the glories that we will receive. Roddy, can you indulge me in a little story here? Sure. You're in 1 Corinthians 13. Yes. Uh, talking about the suffering of Christ, there was a pastor who was uh, counseling drug addicts, and they were all in a circle in his living room, and he was fishing in his mind how that he could portray the love of God to these people and give them a, a look at something new and something fresh and something inspirational. And then a thought came to his mind. Would he allow those heroin addicts to go down the hallway of his house into the bedroom where his little children were sleeping and shoot their veins full of heroin? Mm -hmm. And it just revulsed him. He recoiled at the thought. And he thought, I would do everything in my power to stop them from going down to hurt my children. Mm -hmm. And then the Holy Spirit told him, but I gave my son and I didn't prevent them from hurting him deeply. And this is the kind of love that God has for us. Amen. You can't imagine a scenario like that and yet God Almighty moved right through it 
and gave his dear son, innocent, tender, to these wolves of this earth. You, uh, you mentioned it earlier, um, this, uh, this mystery of iniquity. Yes. And we're going to have to back up a little bit because we need to understand the nature of this war. What was this war really about? How did it take place? There are so many fanciful and fantastical ideas about what this, what the, the nature of this war was. There are ideas possibly that it was, it was a war with weapons and swords mm -hmm. and you know we have army against army and they, they meet together on a battlefield. Uh, surely, surely the God of heaven could have disposed of an army coming against him with a snap of a finger. Surely he could have done that. Mm -hmm. The word war here in Revelation gives us all the insight that we need. And I'm going to share that real quick. It's, mm -hmm. it, it's actually uh, Polemos or Polemos. You're in 12.7 possibly or where are you reading? Yeah, from? we're still in Revelation 12.7. Okay, that's on the screen. Go that's ahead. That's right. There was war in heaven. Yes. This word for war gives us the insight on what kind of war this was that took place. And it's the word polemis from which we get our English word polemic or polemics, mm. which is um, uh, a dispute or a controversy. The art or practice of disputation, a controversial argument against some opinion, some idea, or some doctrine, or a person who argues in opposition to another. Isn't this where we get the word politics as well? Very similar word in that if, I'm going to have to go back and look, but I believe that that root and the concept for politics is is derived from the same polemics or, or polemics. And if you've seen what a political debate looks like, it's ugly. We saw Certainly. that. Can be. What What do you generally think of when you when you think about these ads that politicians run when they are running for office? What is it that they're doing? It's it's slander. They're slandering each other. Slander. Slandering. They're they're ripping their characters to shreds. Right. Mm -hmm. And quite often, a lot of it is just based on lie. There's no truth or reality to yeah. the. Things that are being said. That's the nature of politics, and that was exactly the nature of the war in heaven. At some point, as, as the enemy had his thinking corrupted about God, he began to not only indulge a desire to take God's place, but he wanted to seek constituents. <laughs> just like a politician does. And so he goes around whispering. He goes around talking. Yes. He goes around prevent, presenting false ideas yes. to which the God of heaven, and I'm sure not only did it break his heart, yes. but I'm sure there was entreaty after entreaty after entreaty. Yes. There was meeting after meeting after meeting. There was embrace after embrace for who knows how long mm -hmm. as this war gained traction. And bear this in mind, the arguments against God were so strong and masterful that it even convinced a third of the angels mm -hmm. of heaven well, that's, that's the interesting thing that, that, that helps us to understand this political debate, which is basically what it was, is a, is a war of ideals that's right. in heaven. And, and we know this because in Revelation 12, verse 9, at the very end of the verse, it says that he was cast out mm -hmm. and that his angel, his angels mm -hmm. were cast out with him. So, so we know, or those of us who, who know even just a little bit about about the Bible or about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Anyone that knows the smallest thing about Christianity would know that, okay, Christianity says that there's a God and then there's angels and uh, then there's Lucifer and and there's demons. Well, that's the, the simplest way that you could probably break up the controversy. Sure. 
But what we see is that, that he was cast out as a result of this political conflict mm -hmm. that was ongoing in the heavenly courts mm -hmm. and that his angels, Satan's, or those who sided with Satan, agreed with Satan, or were deceived by Satan, That's right. were cast out with him. So obviously, there were other angels that That's were right. not deceived, that yes. were not cast That's out. That's right. And certainly, we would, we would have to understand and believe that these angels that were not convinced by the arguments Satan had made reasoned with him. That's right. Yes. Absolutely. You know, why do you feel this way? What, what has What's made wrong? you feel uh, that God is this thing that you have perceived him to be? That he ha does not have our best interests hmm. in mind? What, yeah. Why do you think that you deserve this and, and uh, that you deserve to be exalted to this station? And, and it's very interesting that there's something, a detail in these verses that we're reading that is extremely important, yeah. uh, and I think we need to get it right. Let's sure. get it. I'm going to talk a little bit straight to you for a second. As a matter of fact, I'm going to read a quote to you. Uh, this is from a book called The Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 2, page 9. And it's also in a book called Lift Him Up, page 24. Real brief statement. Uh, I'm not going to go into detail about the chapter or, or even the page. That, uh, but it says that the Son of God was next in authority to the great lawgiver. He knew that his life alone was sufficient to ransom fallen man. Okay? Let me read the next statement to you. It's from a different book by the same author. Satan's position in heaven had been next to the Son of God. He was first among the, among the angels. This is Selective Messages, book yes. 1, page 341. So God, let me, let me just lay it out for you, plain and simple. Um, you're not number one. Steve's not number one. Danny Henson is certainly not number one. Neither is Rowdy. Um, God holds the number one position in all of creation, in all of the universe. Yes. God is number one. His son was number two, and Lucifer was next to his son. Yes. He was number three. When he, for whatever reason, began to become ambitious for spot number one or spot number two, whichever he was ambitious to, to take, when he became ambitious to take a position that did not belong to him, that he was not created for, um, things got really bad for him. It says that he was cast out. Okay, that, that's not a victorious pose. Okay, look in Isaiah chapter 14. It says, I'll be like the Most High. And it says, yet you shall be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. It says he wanted to go high. He wanted to go high. The reality is. He went low. Revelation says he was cast out to the earth. Luke chapter 10 verse 18 says, And he said unto them, this is Jesus, mm -hmm. speaking unto his disciples, I beheld Satan as lightning mm. fall from heaven. Mercy me. Mm. So in his heart, he was self-deceived because of his beauty, because of his brilliance, because of his station and authority. He thought, wow, I'm pretty special. Yeah. But I should be more special. I, I want to be more special. I, I need to be more special. Mm. And he sought something that did not belong to him. He coveted a position and station in life that did not belong to him. Mm -hmm. And as a result, by trying to make himself high, mm -hmm. he was pushed low. And it's gonna and it's gonna get worse for him. Right. I know he's listening to us talk. It's going to get worse for him. Much, much worse. You know, we uh, we also mentioned earlier that in relation to this mystery, while it probably wasn't a mystery to God, 
he fully knew and understood where this experiment, where this experience that Lucifer was having, he knew where it would lead, mm -hmm. obviously. Can, can I name that experiment? Sure. Free will. That's right. Amen. Man. That's right. And so, as this darkness settles down upon the universe of God, as this controversy is developing over hundreds of years or thousands of years or however long, uh, God has to, like you say, deal incredibly gently. Because while he understood, the rest of the unfallen angels and the rest of the unfallen worlds are watching this this war, yes. this political yes. debate, right. these false concepts that are being leveled against God. As they're watching all this, God in wisdom has to choose the best possible way to handle this Delicate. so that he doesn't give authority and weight to the accusations to the of arguments. the enemy. Right, that are made against him. If God had risen up right then and there and just hammered down, imagine the message that that would have sent. Yes. And it would have done exactly like you said. It would have overridden the very free will that God allows us to work out in our lives the choices that we make and the consequences that we suffer as a result. And that's what we're going to get into in the succeeding studies. Not to mention, if my oldest child disobeys me, and I kill her in front of my younger child. Oh. If I beat her to death, your relationship with the younger one is, is ruined. the young. What's exactly it's ruined? So, so if you desire, you know, I have a beautiful wife. Um, I could probably have start over whatever I want with her mm -hmm. just by force because she's a small mm -hmm. gal. But what I really desire is 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 love reciprocated. That's, in other words, right. um, it's not really enjoyable to me to be in a relationship with someone. That's right. Unless I feel that I love you and and this love is coming back right. to me. That's right. It's reciprocated, and and God because He is love, mm -hmm. and love exists in that in that dimension, He desires love to be reciprocated That's right. back to yes. Him. Yes. Freely. If it's forced, it's not really love. That's right. It's not the kind of love that he's interested in. That's it's right. not the kind and of love let's, let's that honest. even we're interested in. If really. you force love, you will kill love. You will kill love. It. will cease to exist. Yes. So if God had snuffed Satan out mm -hmm. in the moment uh, at the moment of rebellion, mm -hmm. he would have lost that dynamic That's right. within the realm of his creative That's right. creation. The whole and it, universe. And it goes, yeah. it would have gone exactly contrary to who God is. God being love wasn't concerned about his own well-being or his reputation at that no. point. That's not what he was trying to do. I promise you that he was concerned about the angel who was wandering from him. Yes. And we think, sometimes we think that the, the story of the prodigal son only applies to us fallen sinners on this, on this earth. The God of heaven was broken hearted over that son, that angel that he was losing. Lucifer. Yeah. And there was no way that he was going to act or behave in a way that would push Lucifer farther away. There was going to be no anger. There was going to be no vengeance. vengeance. There was going to be nothing love. but love your enemies. That very principle is, is the principle of the heart of God. And so what did he do? He loved his enemies and he entreated them while allowing them the free will to make the choices and reap the consequences. You know, I, I heard a pastor tell a story and it's similar to what you shared with us. Uh, imagine, if you will, two angels walking the beautiful streets of heaven and one turns to the other and says, I, I haven't seen Lucifer. For a while, mm. and the guy says, "Oh, you, the other angel. Oh, you didn't hear? God snuffed him. God destroyed him. Oh, all right, really? Why? What did he do? Oh, it was something about ambition. I'm not really quite sure. See, I'm not really quite sure. And then the next question: What's ambition? 
<laughs> yeah. Right. Good. But then the other angel would say, I guess we better be careful. Uh oh. Love just changed. The whole dynamic. They're going to worship. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. For better all the reasons. And now that, that was what God had to handle. You know, Very interesting delicate. that you'd say that because there are millions, yay, billions of Christians, those who call themselves, who identify themselves by that title, Christian uh, and Muslim, my Muslim brothers and sisters, who are worshiping God right now for that reason. Can we name it? They're afraid. They're afraid that he will bring judgment against them. Murder them. Mm -hmm. That he will kill them. Mm -hmm. So they're worshiping and they're doing many good works mm -hmm. based upon fear. And and I, I would man. I'll put this forward to you tonight. Our, our time has elapsed for this study. Uh, I'll put this forward. Two things. One, there are those Christians who have bought into a doctrine that tells them I must appease an angry God. I must be a Christian and I must do this or I must do that or I'll be destroyed. Mm -hmm. And they're worshiping based upon, that's their motivation. Yeah. That's the sure. modus operandi. And, and then there are those who have completely rejected the existence of God. It's quite possible there are people watching tonight mm -hmm. that have just decided there is no God. Satan desired something that he was not created for. That's right. You were created for a purpose just as Lucifer was created for a purpose. That's right. Now you can look around this world and see all these complex systems, the hierarchies that exist in nature. You can see the complicated, intricate design of a human cell or DNA or any of these vastly complex things that we can see in the physical world and examine and study and do scientific research on. And you can say there is no God. This all just appeared. Or you can come to terms with this. There was an angel the covering cherub who stood in the presence of the Almighty and said, I want something that I was not created for. Mm. Wow. And as a result, he lost everything mm. and is going to lose even more That's right. Amen. before it's through. Right. Are you going to fall to the same fate? Mm. Is the simple question tonight. Are you going to follow mm. the same fate? Are you going to deny God? Are you going to spurn his love? Fight against. And affection. Yeah. Is that what you want to do? And how's that working out for you so far? Yeah. These are my questions. God bless you all. Um, Steve, could you please close us with a word of prayer? Well, I want your last statement to ring in the ears of our hearers. So I will only say, dear God of heaven, us three desire to put you where you belong, to bring glory to your name, to put you in a place that will bring peace and harmony to all those who listen to this program. And this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Rowdy, thank you so much, brother, for, uh, you, for brother. bringing this study. This is, we're just launching into it. This is a study that will probably carry us forward Several and, more weeks. and I've, I've spent some time reading the study that you provided it's powerful and beautiful so i really want to encourage you guys to come back live at 705 every friday night until next time additionally we have decided that these notes these studies that are typed up here for us uh, the, the the thoughts and ideas on paper as as we've developed these studies um, it's hard to make the points that we want to make all the time. We're, we're constrained by time, sure. obviously, and uh, wanting to keep it flowing as smooth as possible. We miss so much. We will make all of these notes and studies available to anyone that wants them. Just shoot an email or a request, and we'll just send forward us them a, to uh, you. Send us a message on Facebook. Send us your email. We can email them straight to you. So, yes, if, if these notes are interesting 
to you and you'd like to have them for, uh, um, for further investigation, please double check every word yeah. that comes out of our mouth. Right. May, may, I, may I say that there is a thorough examination of this subject in a book by the name The Great Controversy by Ellen G. White. Yeah. The Great Controversy by Ellen G. White. Life-changing book. That book changed my life. Yeah. All right. Thank you, guys. Good thank night. You. Good night. Good night. Everyone. God bless you.